Tuesday talk today. Um, I'm very honored to be introducing the novelists. But before I do, I wanted to just give you a reminder of what's coming up at the museum. This evening at 5 o'clock, we have a symposium that is going on in the um, lecture hall number 120 at 5 p.m. And it is a discussion of abstraction in art. It will consist of artists and scholars discussing abstraction. So it'll be a very good conference. Please try and come. Also, Thursday is our museum party. You should come. <laughs> oh, I am. Oh, good. <laughs> so that's from 5.30 to 8.30. <laughs> This Thursday, we'll have a lot of fun at games and art making along the front. We will have a DJ with Sam. We will have um, a food truck for food, and we'll have some soft drinks for you. And we will have our wonderful docents leading discussions in the museum space for people who are interested. So as we move forward, I also wanted to tell you that we at 1.30 will have our um, meditation and we'll be kind of flipping and looking at the Jennifer York piece that is called Have More and then parentheses blonde. And I just love it how she's just taken hair and reduced it to this inkjet repeat. It's beautiful. <laughs> just brilliant. So that'll be our meditation at 1 30. Um, and then I wanted to give you the land acknowledgement. So and also acknowledge that um, these Tuesday talks were made possible with funds from the students on campus, the ASI group, and there's a special pot of funds called the IRA funds, and they have made it possible for us to bring some amazing artists in to talk. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that the ongoing presence and relationship of the First People on whom land our institution resides. California State University Long Beach is located on the sacred site of the Pavunga. We further acknowledge that we are on the land of the Tongva Gabrieleño and the Hachaman Hawaiian nations who have lived and continue to live here. We recognize these nations for their spiritual connection as the first stewards and traditional caretakers of this land. We thank them for their strength, for their perseverance, and their resistance. It's my honor now to introduce Kim Abeles, whose diptych, A Mile a Minute, L.A. to Del Mar as seen by a moving train, is featured in this exhibition, Hurry Slowly. Kim Abeles is an artist whose artworks explore biography, geography, feminism, and the environment probably much more. Her work speaks to society, science literacy, civic engagement, and she creates projects with the Science Center, the National Park Service, and many more. One of her collaborations that I think is really interesting is with air pollution control agencies and involves images from smog and larger scale projects she's done with natural history museums in California, Colorado, and Florida. And in those, she's incorporated specimens ranging from lichen to nudie branches, which I don't know what those are, but <laughs> cool. Um, in 1987, she innovated a method to create images from smog in the air. How brilliant is that? And the, this show called Smog Collections brought her work to national and international attention. Uh, she's received many fellowships from the Guggenheim, J. Paul Getty Trusts, the Visual Arts California Community Foundation, the Pollock Krasner Foundation. Her work is in over 40 public collections, including the Clico Contemporary, MOCA, LACMA, Berkeley Art Museum, Brooklyn, uh, California African American Museum, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Okay. Her processes and documents are also archived in the Center for Art and Environment at Nevada Museum of Art. So please welcome with me, Kim Nellis. Thank you. Um, and a couple of you back there, do you want to sit down? Do, do you want to sit, sit or there are chairs here? You're good? OK. All right. Uh, and if you have any questions on my resume or you know the bio, Hmm, made some questions for me. Are you too uh, done? But 
Yeah, I think I am, yeah? Okay, Let's double check. Double check. Yeah. Um, it should have been recording. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. I must have, I won't bend over too far. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, thanks so much for having me here. And I'll tell you, um, I've made a couple notes for myself and I'm going to talk for, we thought about a half hour or something like that, you know, and, and then if you have questions, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, um, to do that, because maybe I say something and you'd like me to expand on it or whatever. Um, the happy thing for me is that when museums own my work, I only get to see it when they're up. And as you know, like, you know, they're not always up. So I, if you see me a bunch of times while it's here, uh, it'll be great. Um, some of you may know Lucinda Barnes, who had been uh, the curator here. Uh, and she was actually, I don't think she was at the museum when um, the foundation donated this piece. There was a, a fund in New York that selected this piece to give to the museum, and that's really how it came here. I don't know, it might say that on on the placard. Forgive me for not having that name at the top of my head. But um, so for me as an artist, I always have to look at my work often in slide form, right? And so I'm a little emotional. I guess this is what I'm trying to tell you. That um, does it say on there yeah, about the fund? It says the, uh, it was a gift of the American Academy and Institute of Arts and Letters, Hassam and Spectre Purchase Fund. Purchase Fund. So anyway, I think it's, I'm, thank you, because I, I think it's important to acknowledge like how works of art get in museums like this, right, or any museum. You know, how does that really happen? Um, so... This piece was made in 1986. And when I was preparing to talk with you, I was trying to think, uh, how did this come about? It's like, so um, I'm not really big on doing series. I'm gonna put that out there from the get-go. Uh, early on in my career, like a lot of artists, I would think of things in series, like in art school, we're really pressured to do that. And I was often along the way very resistant to it. I would get to sort of a point in maybe a format that I liked, and then I wasn't really interested to just keep, you know, churning out similar works. And um, for that reason, <laughs> there two things kind of happened. One is that I always was on a learning curve with the new work, right? It wasn't like I had honed a particular skill. And I work in a lot of different materials, you know, from drawing, as you see here, to welding, using delicate things like smog and heavier things like concrete. So, uh, so I'm always kind of honing a new skill, right? So. In, a, in the upside of that, I'm always like the student that's like, wow, how's this work? Oh, not as easily as I thought, <laughs> you know? And, and really realizing that um, there's, there's a never-ending amount of learning, not only in the subjects of the art, but in terms of the materials themselves. So the second thing that I was going to say about sort of not moving in very neat series is that I did anyway. And this is what I mean by that. I, at one point, wanted to do a series of coffins, okay, or sarcophagi. And I had been in this mode where I didn't want to work in series like that, but in hindsight, looking back, I made four pieces with installations that had coffins in them. So my point is that I think that there's a vocabulary that comes about for an artist, and you move that 
vocabulary forward, but not necessarily in a neat linear motion. Okay, so this particular idea of doing skylines started actually with a, a, a sculptural piece I made with a U.S. Postal Service ba uh, bag made into a corset, okay? I'm not giving you vis visuals, you know, to see, but I think you can sort of picture where I'm heading with this. And it was the idea that I would make these two love letters from New York to Los Angeles, and I would make them with the skylines of each city. So instead of writing a normal letter with you know, typical language, love language. It was really the love language of the horizon of the city. And that became part of the sculpture. And um, how I did that was I got access to tall buildings in both cities. And at the time, I was traveling a lot. So I did this in quite a few cities, in fact. And I would get the access to the tall building. I would stand in one spot and I would turn in a pivot point and draw that horizon so it was one complete circle, right? And so that became this way of sort of encapsulating what those cities look like. Because after all, it is like the skylines that we often recognize in a film or something, right? That's how you recognize which city is it you're seeing. So I've done it in L.A. actually twice from the same building, so you actually see that skyline change within the two pieces. So um, I, I was going back and forth for exhibits to San Diego on the train quite a bit at this time period, and, you know, you'd see the, the skyline go past you, and on one of those times, I decided to actually draw that skyline while the train was moving. And it's called a mile a minute because that's how fast I could draw. And that's how fast the train went. So it really becomes this increment of time as well as really seeing changes within the landscape that are very visible or cliffs and things like that. So what I wanted to share with you today, I was thinking back to that day that I did that, and there was a little kid on the train that was sitting a couple seats away, and she was so intrigued by what I was doing that she I could, because I could hear all this, right? And it's what it, what is it, a two two hour plane uh, train ride, I think. Um, she begged her mom for some paper and a pencil because she wanted to do it too. So it was, you know, too bad I don't have that. But it was very sweet that this child really understood what was happening, not just like, oh, there's the skyline, here's the paper, but but the importance of it. And, and I, I listed like four terms that today I'll, I want to at least touch upon. And one is physicality and process. One is artists in public. One is line. And one is vocabulary. I hit on vocabulary a little bit with the anecdote about the coffins that, you know, an artist has a vocabulary, right? And, and we're sort of collecting those words, those image words, as we go along. And the physicality is maybe obvious with the way this piece was actually made, right? On a train, on a bumpy train, right? And with paper and pen in hand, and just being like zeroed in on that landscape in that sort of way. But it also, with that story about the child, I think it touches this idea of the artist in public. I do a lot of public art, and I'm actually going to, I'll show you a piece that got finished at the end of last year, but um, public is an interesting word to me because for me, public might be that one child. And when I've got, done, done walking pieces and stuff, the people I come across along the way, they're, they're the public. So as a, as a community-based artist and a public art you know, maker, 
Um, of course, there's many people that get involved with these larger projects, right? Many agencies, I, I've done three with LA County Arts and Culture. I've done them with the uh, Department of, of Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Department and other organizations. And that's public in the sense of who's gonna see the work when it's up. I've gotta be very sensitive to that and understand that and understand that they are stakeholders also. But also all the people in those agencies that I work with um, on the project, well, they become my public too. Because it's not just the outcome I'm looking for, the process is the big thing that drives me. And I know it makes people nervous sometimes because I can't say, hey, I'm gonna make you one of these, you know? <laughs> so I'm always like in, in commissions trying to really kind of, oh God, do I use the word sell? Sell the idea that the process will really be the strongest way for us to go forward, even if we don't quite know where that road will take us. Um, because artists do that in the studio all the time. Karina, artist right here, very process-oriented person, so I, I see why you're, you know, understanding that, right? It's, it's back to that thing I said about wanting to always be the student again, like wanting to be a little, I, well, I call it on my website, I want to be um, lost in the dark with a broken flashlight. <laughs> you know, so you get the idea. Um, so, um, let's see. I posted this talk on Facebook and Instagram, and I got all sorts of interesting comments about this piece. And for me, art really becomes this accumulation of all these comments and stories that people say. Because after all, this isn't just my thing. And especially now that it's here and out, now it's you guys have it, okay? You can take the story where you want to take it. You know, I'm only one part in, in that trajectory of how artwork comes. I just happen to have the pen, okay? So my friend Tom Nixon, who uh, is uh, very well-known, well like um, MC and musicologist, right, okay? He, he posted this when he saw it, okay? And he said to me, reminds me of these leaves from the 18th century Tibetan musical score for voice, drums, trumpets, horns, and cymbals. And a lot of people said that, some kind of music connection, because you can see it. And if you think of the way that it's being discussed as a mile, you know, a mile a minute, like a six, it's an in increments of 60 seconds, isn't it? Then it really makes sense that this is much more a musical score than perhaps how I described me doing the pivot point horizons. Those are more like, I'm the turntable, right? So the music connection is only a physical one of turning in the pivot point. And then this becomes very lyrical, doesn't it? So that connection was great. So another word I brought up with you is, is vocabulary. And um, a couple things I wanted to mention Oh, okay, so I mentioned public art. Um, so next to the Grand Central Market downtown, I have a few artworks there that have been there for um, almost 30 years, actually. And um, basically, it's some seating out there on Hill Street. And I'm telling you on these plaques uh, how to get to seven different sites in the city, like architectural sites, from your seat using mass transit. Okay, here's how the, here's the bus, or here's the metro stop, that kind of thing, right? So I go there now and then, because I lived downtown for about 35 years, and so I go visit some of these pieces a lot. Well, graffiti has really taken over it, but I'm gonna, ex so I, I'm showing you a few. Do you see it on the top there? 
So on the top, without anything, it's actually um, the, it's the buildings that I'm telling you about, and they're drawn in proportion to one another, okay? But then people have added things, right? <laughs> to be honest, I love that. <laughs> I mean, I don't... I go there and I do not feel upset at all. Isn't that a gauge of something? You know, like, because it, the, the way this process was, it's porcelain enamel on steel. They're scoring on there with a paper clip or whatever they're using or a knife or something, really makes it the same linear feature as the drawing I did. I only really got upset when they moved down to like Aileen Barnstall's portrait with her daughter. That was, you know, because then it's like, no, 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 keep it up there, will ya? So um, public art, that's what happens. It's out there in the world. You can't like put a guard there and protect it, right? <laughs> so um, I often actually go to my artworks out there and I put an orange vest on and a hat, a helmet, you know and then hard hat, and then just start working on it. And again, nobody bothers me. I just fix things all the time. <laughs> so, um, oh, so part of the reason I wanted to show you this is that this drawing shows up on here. And it shows up on here because this particular one is Union Station. You know, I'm telling you how to get to Union Station. So that's where, for me, I've got this whole score of visual language that is always interweaving into the other works. And to me as an artist, it makes me really believe I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, that all these things start, there's an interconnectedness that has nothing really to do with me, that's just sort of in that way of thinking of how I personally make work. Can you kind of see the difference in that? Can I um, ask a question? I'm sure. I'm curious if you think this is partly because you are so interdisciplinary that these are just different languages that just coalesce. Because I wonder about that. I mean, you work yeah. with everything and it all just works together. It's like just different. Uh, different languages with the same content. Yeah, I think you're really right. I mean, I, I'm really aware that my work looks like I work in all these different materials and forms, right? So that, but people still identify it as my work. It, so it's not like, um, you know, where things are more obviously like just the same sort of work, and but it's a different color, it's a different composition, that sort of thing. So, um, but, I, but I feel like I always need to be awake to what the materials are talking to me about, because I, I do feel that there's kind of this communication between the stuff. And I mean, like some of you know, I do uh, in the past, more in the past, I suppose, assemblage work, you know, where you go, you know, add things that are already existing because of our industrial society for the most part. And um, like I don't I would never think to go to a thrift store and go buy something like that. Like, oh that looks cool. I'll make a piece out of it. I have things that people have given me or that I've mostly that people have given me that one day make their way into a piece. And maybe you can see the difference, right? I'm not like dictated by that object. I'm dictated really by the idea. So that, that maybe really lends to what, what you're saying. Um, this thing about art in public, and also, you know, this is like about map making, really, too, right? And so I, I mentioned, I thought I'd show you a couple images of this piece that maybe some of you know that in near Han Park, Kenneth Han Park, there's a park to ply a trail. And it actually starts uh, a little bit east of um, La Brea, and then it goes all the way to the beach. So when I do a commission on something like this, I did walk this 13 miles. I wanted to see how people use that trail, because they use it very differently depending on which section you're on. 
So this one actually always incorporates the trail map on, in some part or version. And it opens up with two sugar pine cones. And so they open up, for me it was like kind of welcoming you. And in this case, the trail, you can actually see the entire trail and all the citizen seeds that I made, where they are. But on the other side is a hand where the trail becomes the line in the hand, almost like palm reading then, right? So these kind of taking things, and this is a line, but it's also music. You know, it's also a letter, you know, a language in that way. So those kind of layers are important to me. Um, number six seed is actually a manzanita, which are normally like this big, right? <laughs> okay, got a little carried away. Turned out to be the biggest one. And... Um, same sort of thing. This one has directionals so that if you are there, you know that Bologna Creek is over there or you know different parts, right? And um, part of the goal for me on this was the idea that people use this trail all the time. They really didn't need art on there to get people to go there. And I, and I had to really sober up to that, right? <laughs> so what could I do? I could get people to want to go further. Everybody does their little jog from this point to this point. Wow, why don't you go to there? So it was all really about trying to do that. This is another one. This is a coast live oak. And again, you know, you see, in this case, you see the horizon of Los Angeles. So here we go again. These horizons coming up. This time it's in Terrazzo. So maybe some of you know, you know that usually it's on floors and stuff with the rock and the glass and then the polished uh, uh, surface. And this is a black walnut. And then I, and then I, I haven't shown you a couple of them, but um, but I had to show you this. This is how they are installed. <laughs> okay, so we did these in the night because we didn't want hikers to get hurt. But sure enough, you start putting lights and, you know, and cranes up on a hill like that. Oh my gosh, suddenly there were bands of people. <laughs> And so this part of making art, this is physicality, right? It's just, it's the same physicality that made this. That sort of pushing your body one, one step further, you know? And so the relationship is that. Um, I think the last thing I was gonna show you of what I brought actually, was to show you that sometimes these horizons have been translated into smog. And I, I know that some of you know my smog work, but this is that piece I told you where I did a pivot point in Los Angeles. This is that horizon made out of the smog in the air. So maybe there's a question for you. Anyway. Are you actually photographing, or you're just remembering? I'm drawing. You're drawing I'm know. literally drawing. And you know, that's a good question. Um, did you guys hear that, like the idea when I did the pivot point, um, you know, where they photographed and then take them back to the studio? Um, I need it harder than that, mm -hmm. and more direct, I guess you would say. So there's something about it that, um, because I think the way that I did it instead of photographing refers a lot to like landscape painting and drawing. I, I think for me, those kind of historical references to what I'm doing are really important for me. I mean, they're real, I mean, I, you know, did go to art school, so, <laughs> so you know, those things don't leave you. So those, those loyal, I would call it a loyalty to the process. You know, not trying to make, yeah, oh good, oh, thanks. Um, so I don't know, I'm gonna guess I went a half hour. And um, I, I should, does anybody have any questions?
What yeah. Are you on now? Oh. Oh. What am Sorry, I working on now? Um, you know, I'm finishing up a public art piece on a mixed-use building in San Gabriel, and it's based on research I did of the oldest trees that are still living on Earth. And I wanted them to geographically really span. We have a lot in North America, but I didn't want to, this was about really like seeing the world through that. And, and so the leaves are made on metal and they're all like four feet and stuff, the, the leaf of that tree, right? But the image on the leaf, I purchased photographs from photographers who photographed the tree so it's the sky from the location where the tree is. And a legend kind of tells you all this. It tells you the neighborhood name for the tree as well as the botanical name. It tells you the photographer who took that sky photo, uh, the age of the tree, and the location. So, so it goes 60 feet up in the air. It was, talk about physical. Oh my gosh, I don't know why scaffolding isn't made a little more solid. It's like, <laughs> That was really hair raising, man. Just laminate it on the no, it's a process that's more durable. It's it's a company in Canada that um, they actually they take my digital files and then I have to make Illustrator files for the shapes of the leaves and stuff, and kind of work back and forth on that, and then they bake it on. Oh, like an enamel. It's not enamel because it's more durable. Oh, wow. Yeah. And then I had it done on both sides of the leaves so that we could curl them after so the sky comes, you know, that the imagery is on both sides. And yeah, I'm pretty psyched about it. I mean, I started that piece in 2015 and we still have a little more to install. There's a second part to it. I don't know, you wanna hear it or am I exhausting you? Okay. <laughs> I'll, and then I'll go with you. This. So I have a question for Chris. Chris, remember when the call and response was exhibit, and this was displayed, and Martin Herman came over with musicians, oh. and he did an interpretation of oh. that taste. Was there a record of that, video record of that? I'm not aware that there was. Oh, I didn't hear about that. I knew the show, and I came to the show, actually. The opening, I guess it was. Oh, man, I would have loved that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's a musician you know? Okay, I see. Oh, man. Well, all right, I'm in. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. We're talking, well, that's working on another yeah. project, so we'll see. Yeah, he does the electronic music group. Well, oh, awesome. nice. That sounds so dreamy. It's amazing, yes. I'm yeah. Again, so. Oh, thanks for bringing that up. I think I just I forgot about that event. Yeah, that's beautiful. But you were talking about. Yes, back to part two. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Picture this. Okay. <laughs> The, the second site on the building has only nine leaves. The first part has like 35 leaves going up, you know. It's almost six-story building, actually. Wow. And, and, um, and uh, but, but there's another section that only has nine leaves. And I started, it kind of reads left to right, and I started with the earliest leaf of what they call a tree. And they're called Archaeotopolis? Topuses? Okay. Right. I'm very close. But it's called a fossil leaf, is the kind of friendly name. And so on that, and then they run to, to ginkgo, which I thought was a great ending point, because ginkgos were early on too. 
Garden of Eden stories have ginkgos in them, and you know, it's a historical tree, but we also still have them. So I thought that was a good ending. And then there's leaves in between, right? But the imagery is on the first leaf, the oldest leaf is an image of the universe. And I had asked a friend of mine who is really a rocket scientist, for real, I said, oh, could you turn me on to what you think is the best image of the universe? Because, you know, you can Google stuff, but I wanted to hear it from the real guy, right? So um, NASA had worked for nine years on this image of the universe that's really based on heat and cold and those, that kind of imagery accumulated, and it is the most concise image of the universe that we have. You don't, so I saw it, and at first I was like, where are the stars and things, you know? But this is like Baker. The stars, you wouldn't even see them in here, because they're like, this is bigger, right? So I put that imagery on that ancient of leaves, right? And then all the imagery runs closer and closer to where you're standing at the building. And then the picture of the building is there. So you're kind of moving into space, right? And then two of the images are from Apollo trips to the moon. And the thing I love about this one is that it was done with a Hasselblad camera, which is a film camera, old school, analog. And I love that the first one's done with technology that none of us in this room could probably explain, right? <laughs> like really intense technology that we as humans have gone toward. And then there's this one analog image where, you know, they got out and they took this camera and they went click and you see the earth beyond, you know? So I like that the imagery also travels through time in terms of when it was made and how it was made. So it's the smallest part of this piece, but to me, that research was just so exciting. It was, you know, because all those little details you come up with, like what kind of camera do they use, you know? It just becomes this beautiful thing about what we really are as people. We are a bunch of details. You know, and okay, I got too excited, maybe. <laughs> okay, and yeah. Those cameras are still on the moon, so they could oh. bring the rocks back. See, they kept the film. Can you? The cameras don't the you want to just like <laughs> eat that up? It's like, <laughs> thank you for telling me that. I look trash everywhere, right? It's like... <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, those are collector item cameras. It's worth the trip to go get it. <laughs> did you have a question or did I answer it? Okay. All right. Mile minute being on the train and you did drawing mile minute and I'm thinking of myself being on the train. There's sort of that lull of being on the train. Did that impact that drawing at all? That sort of comfort. Yeah, but the musicality of it, of being on a train. And, and the move, a little bit of movement. Get into the physical, the churning of the train and your drawing. Totally and with you on that. I have childhood memories of. That. I do have some good childhood memories, you know, like a couple, and th being on a train is one. Right. But, but in the way drawing, you're saying it, and I can feel it. Too. I actually feel it. Yeah, and you know, you saying that, I can feel that, and and I know exactly that what you're talking about. Trains. Oh my gosh, let's go on a train trip. Like, well, I think isn't the Amtrak on? strike or something somebody told me I don't know is that true okay cut that part out I guess but um anyway but that's nice you know that feeling because it is supposed to be visceral like that yeah 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 I thought when you started that you talked about this was both New York skylines and Los Angeles skylines, but then you were on the train from Los Angeles. Was New York omitted, or were you drawing New York while you were also? Oh, on the train? okay. Yeah, I probably did do like a woo, and then let me tell you that and confuse <laughs> things. 
Um, this is the train to LA to Del Mar. Okay. You know, the coast yeah, one, right? Yeah. And, but you know why I'm glad you mentioned that? Because uh, I did talk about doing pivot point drawings in different cities. I did them in Berlin and up, anyway, various cities. Um, the reason I'm glad that you mentioned that is that <laughs> around the time I did this, I applied for a grant because I wanted to do one. I checked out the train from LA to New York and there's kind of a train that ran at that time anyway, right across, like cut right in the middle of the country like that. And I tried to get a grant to get somebody to fund me to do this from LA to New York. And I had a friend that was early on in computer stuff and he made a program for me that would be kind of picture a tablet that would have the digital paper moving that way oh. instead of this way, right? So it was all kind of worked out, but I didn't get the grant. And I, I still have the grant application, and I look at it sometimes, and I think, you know, they didn't think I could do this. That's, that's what happened. They didn't think I had the stamina in me. Now, you might ask, why wouldn't I just do it myself? You need backing on stuff like that. I, I mean, I never had enough money to just like take off for <laughs> a week or two and, you know, do that. So, but thanks, because I, I don't know, maybe sometimes artworks become these beautiful memories that you get to experience and, and think that they went well, you know. Did you find other obstacles in your career that just really resonate with you, like paths that got shut down or things like that that happened along your route? Yeah, I mean, if you want the shutdown stories, I mean, you know, there's always like, <laughs> I just get curious. you know, <laughs> but there, they, no, I think being an artist is really hard. I think that most of the time people don't understand like how challenging it really is not only to just survive financially, right? But um, but also self-doubt. I think any artist that's really like digging deep, yeah, Corinne is <laughs> like nodding too. It's really hard. You're really like exposing yourself quite a bit. And I'm not talking about artwork that's like autobiographical and about my icky this or that, you know. I've done that work too, but... I'm just saying any art where you're you're always going to have a doubt quotient going on there and 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 to push past that is really amazing. But I but I the what was the word you used about the failure? No, 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 not failure. You used a different word. The shut down. Shut down. Oh, shut down. Oh, great. Okay. So, I did have one. This is a little con contrary to me not doing that cross country okay. is that uh, I'm, I can't really tell real specifics without hurting people but um, <laughs> <laughs> are in agencies and stuff but um, I had this great idea well I can sort of say what it was uh, never mind okay <laughs> I, <laughs> I had this idea that I really liked and there was a meeting with all the heavy hitters. Okay, you just picture who you think are heavy hitters, okay? And um, they tried to convince me to do something else. They wanted me to basically do an Ed Ruscha on something. And I said, well, ask Ed Ruscha then. <laughs> it's like, so anyway, I'm kind of proud that I stood up sometimes to these things because I think there's a lot of pressure on artists to like produce in a certain way and, and stuff like that. Um, so I went ahead actually and made the piece anyway in a smaller scale, an installation. It wasn't like that small, but not outdoors and, you know, but I just went ahead and did it anyway because maybe I learned from the story that I told you about the LA to, uh, to New York trip, right? I do think there's a real problem if the muse is coming and giving you an idea and you go, oh, sorry, I don't have it in me to do it, you know? She's going to go somewhere else. It's like, 
I don't, why would she waste my time, or, you know, her time on me if I'm not willing to do everything I can in my power to go follow through, right? So that's why, if I think of the chronology of that moment and this moment, I felt it was really important to do that. Mm. Okay. Yep. Well, I'm sorry. I, I, I travel a lot in, sometimes in a metro, going from Long Beach to Los Angeles, and I always like to see the, the edge. But uh, uh, when you were doing these drawings, do you focus in, in the negative of the, of, or, or the positive of the shapes? Oh, that's a good question. Positive. The actual meeting of the sky. Yeah, or if you'll see, like, sometimes there's maybe a telephone pole or something, yeah. you know, like that's indicated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I see what you mean, because on those rides, sometimes you're looking all down there, and sometimes you're looking... <laughs> no, that's beautiful. I like that. When I, when I saw that, it's, uh, it's amazing. Yeah, so, thank you. That was really good. Yeah. My question was about the muse. When the muse is upon you, how do you know that? What happens to you when the muse strikes? Wow. No, that's like beautiful. Just That's a beautiful question. Write that down. It's like, <laughs> no, because it is. No, and I'm, I always try to make jokes, but I, no, that's a beautiful question. And you just made me think like, oh, what does that feel like? Yeah. Well, I think my answer is maybe not going to help you, but I'll tell you this. Okay, I, I think especially people that are trained as artists, or, and, they, and I always mean any kind of art. I'm not always talking just about visual art, okay? Um, I could, if you give me a piece of paper right now, I'll make you a piece of art. Give me 10 minutes, I'll make you a piece of art, right? But that real piece of art, the one that really pushes me and I'm a little afraid to do it, you maybe you're gonna laugh at me or you're gonna tell me I, you're gonna, there's a million criticisms you can make on a piece of art. We won't list all those words, right? But they're there and I think that operates in an artist. But I think when the muse comes, it's a really inspired idea. And that does come in a sort of physical reaction you have to it. You know what I mean? And no, I. No, that's why I'm asking because I, I don't sing, I don't dance, I can't paint. But I love being surrounded by beauty. And so I wonder what does the artist feel? How do they know that this is the real thing? Yeah. Well, I think it's because patience is really important to it. I, I, and that's maybe why I use that illustration, like, just give me a paper, I'll make you something. You know, um, I think, well, especially with social media, I know you're probably sick of hearing of social media, but <laughs> social media, you think things are quick, you see a million images every day, you know, clever things, kitties, I, you know, like, puffies, oh God, let's just do that. But um, but I just think it takes patience to let ideas flow. And one thing I personally do, if I think I want to make, if say a topic is really bothering me and I want to tackle it, I read a lot about it. If there's something I have to watch film-wise, documentary, I just feed myself every element of it and just it's like, and then we're going to put it in a bottle and we're going to go like that. And then the muse comes. Oh, that's it's kind of like that. Look, I see a lot of nods, like people know that thing. But if you're impatient, like that's what's, I think, difficult in school situations. Okay, Friday, you got to have this idea and make this thing. By Friday, it's <laughs> like, I can make you something, but, you know... And I think we do kind of pressure show deadlines. You know, I have contracts I sign for larger projects. You know, that's a lot of pressure to come up with an inspired idea, right? But I do think if you just like feed, 
you know, Gertrude Stein said, you are what you eat. And she meant really her writing, you know. So I, I kind of think of things like that, too. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Oh, yeah. Hi. I was like an art student, um, and you went to art school. When did you kind of like find, I mean, because you go in so many directions and explore so many ideas, how did you kind of like find that path? And was there like a different idea you had of what you were going to do, like entering art school and like what you ended up doing? Oh, kind of like I went in thinking one thing yeah. and came out the other. And. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I went to I went to grad school at UC Irvine. I went there actually because I wanted to be able to focus on my work for two years. I mean, really, that's why I went. Um, so maybe that's a different picture of why people usually go there. I had been, you know trying to sell my paintings and doing craft shows. And I wrote a crafting cookery and country living book. I mean, I was like doing a lot of things, but I just wanted to really focus on it. So I went in as a painter there and I came out as a conceptual artist, but I still was very much a maker because of my crafts background and my painting background. I did trompe l'oeil painting, so it was very rigorous kind of painting. So, um, and I just kept pushing forward. I just kept pushing out of the way people that were trying to box me into a type of work. That, I think that's a big thing. Now, I can see that in these late years of my life as a regret, too. Oh, God, why did I say that to them? You know, why did I say I wouldn't do that when the waiting lists were happening and stuff? So, you know, like, I think the way we push forward is is also a lot of risk-taking to do that. But to me, I, okay, here's one thing that maybe will make you feel better. <laughs> is that, um, I like I said, I think it's really hard to be an artist. Okay, we got that established, right? <laughs> In my, that was a theme of this, I think. <laughs> and... Um, I figure that if this is what I'm doing, then I should be able to do what I want to do with it. There's not too many places in life you can do that. And art ought to be one of them. Is there other places we get to do that? I don't know. So you see what I mean? It's, it's worth everything for me to do the work I really want to do. And I've done some really horrible pieces of art. I mean, I, I will be the first to say some real dogs, you know? <laughs> but it's okay because it led me to something else. I think that's the risk, right? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't always have to be a, pos a perfect outcome, you know? I had <laughs> gonna just well, and then we should probably go, you guys. But I, I had this piece. I lived on Second and Broadway downtown, and I had this piece. I swear to God, I tried to make this piece work. I tried, oh God, reworking it. It was big. It was like it wasn't like a little thing. <laughs> and so I decided one day I'm just gonna put it in the dumpster. Okay. And then I went, and the dumpster was by the parking lot, and I went out the next day, and sure enough, it's, it's outside of the dumpster. And the parking lot guy's like, Kim, do you know anything about this? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no. And this went on for days, putting it back in at night. It came out. I guess eventually they took it away, or I cut it smaller or something. I don't know. But I'm just saying that, it was okay, because it actually led me to some really nice work that followed it, but I had to go that low, that deep, right? <laughs> so anyway, you know, you've been a great audience. I, I just appreciate the <laughs> everything. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.